So, we've come to the end of the national selections for the Eurovision Song Contest 2024. All of the songs for this year's contest have been released, and the focus from here on out is going to be on Eurovision itself. Some of you have been asking about selections that I didn't cover on this channel, and so I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about each of them before too much time passes, and explain a little bit about how each one unfolded. Now there's been a lot of great music this season, and I would love to talk about each and every song that I enjoyed, but I've decided to limit myself to to one per selection so that everybody is covered and to give a shout out to a song that didn't win because I feel like there's something worth recognizing. And my hope is that if you didn't see these songs or performances that you check out some of them for yourself. So let's start with the very first selection that ended back in December. ESCZ over in Czechia has been running under various different formats since they introduced the selection in 2018. Last year was the first time that they were able to do it as a live program, which has been something that they've wanted to do for a while, and this year they were able to do it with a live audience. Now if we were to compare this selection to some of the others that we see, there would be a number of flaws to point out in terms of the production quality and the viewing experience. I'm not going to do that because this is clearly a work in progress, and I don't really think it's worth much to uphold ESCZ to bigger selections if it's just not attainable at this point. What should be addressed is that none of the performances were well executed, and that might have been just the general nerves of the artists, or it could have been a technical issue. The other thing is that the environment just doesn't lend itself well to a Eurovision selection because it's clearly a nightclub, which means that you're lacking the level of immersion that you would need. And so while I admire them for chasing this goal of putting on a live program, if it affects the ability for the performances to be as good as they can be, it might not really be worth it. I was actually a big fan of how they went about the selection in 2022, where they still had live performances, but they were live to tape in a controlled studio environment where all of the technical aspects were much stronger. With respect to our winner, Ico and Pedestal, I think it was one of the stronger songs out of the selection. I like that it has this kind of like PJ Harvey sound to it, and there's nothing else at Eurovision like this, so it has a chance to stand out. The only thing that I'll say about the performance itself, keeping in mind that the environment was not the best way to present this song, is that I hope that she has a bit of a different approach to the choreography, because right now it's looking a lot like an aerobics routine, and for that reason I'm not surprised that she was getting a bit breathy towards the end. The shout out is going to go to Ellie with the Angel's Share, as I think it was the only other song that came close to having the full package. It was also the audience favorite from within Czechia, and a very well deserved second place. Festivali Ikungis is one of the most traditional selections that we have here. It borrows a lot of influence from San Remo in Italy, including having a live orchestra and keeping songs predominantly in the local language. One thing that's been missing in the last few years is that we're not getting the songs published in advance of the show, and sometimes they don't even get published after the show because it's mostly the artists that are uploading it themselves, and it makes covering the selection quite hard, especially since I don't have like a contact in Albania, so we're not going to go too too deep into this one. The winner was Bessa with the song Zemran Nador, which was recently translated into English as Titan. It's a fairly in-character entry for Albania, and I, I don't really know if it's the most competitive choice because again, we didn't hear the studio versions for all the songs. I would say that it does have a cool blend of adult contemporary R&B and hip hop in it, and so there's a chance for it at least to stand out if it's staged correctly. As for the shout out, there's no question in my mind about it. It goes out to Luan with Perseritia, who put together 90s trance, orchestral music, and spoken word into a song about the human condition. Probably a little too out of character for Albania, but it was a very cool song and performance that I was really happy to see. Repetition is my own mother. Ireland's Eurosong is a selection that is criticized a lot for its format. I did a video about this, about how using the Late Late Show is always going to have its limitations as far as choosing the right song. 
But despite that, they went with one of their best options by going with Bambi Thug. The song will be unmistakable when it goes to Eurovision, and I think that they can really elevate it by playing up into the Wiccan and occult imagery. I don't think that qualification is guaranteed, but we can talk about that in May. The best thing about this is that Ireland is not playing it safe this year and they're not going to be forgotten about, and that's enough to celebrate. Now, if we were to consider the performances as a whole, I think that the most well-rounded entry was Erica Cody's. Everything from the vocals to the visuals was much tighter than everything else. But the shout out is going to go to JLOL and Toshin with Judas, as I think that the song itself was more modern and more of a standout than Erica's was. And I'm hoping that one day we can get a song like this, this kind of like laid back, melancholic hip hop to Eurovision, because we're overdue for it. To reassure not to be treated as kings, no, we were more than disobedient kids who lead the boys couldn't reward and then believe the things we see on Wikipedia links. Like, are your thoughts really your thoughts or what the media thinks? I said it's crazy. Luxembourg made its long anticipated return to Eurovision with a brand new national selection, and a lot of people seem to be quite impressed with what they were able to do on a first time back because it felt like it met the modern standard for what a selection should be. Now, from a technical point of view, I would agree because they clearly had a lot of technology available to them that you don't see at some of the selections that we've already talked about, but I felt like the setup was really underutilized. The camera shots were really long, distant, and lacked motivation. The lighting was bright and plain, and generally speaking, it felt more like a Eurovision pre-party than a proper national selection. With respect to the songs, I'm hoping that they'll have more variety for the next few years because they had like anthems and, you know, catchy melodies, but thematically they were very similar and it seemed like most people just gravitated towards Drowning in the Rain and Fighter, which ended up being the top two in the end. But despite that, I think that they went with the right winner with choosing Tally and Fighter. It had the most dynamic melody of all the songs, and the overall sound to it just has this unique identity to it as well. The shout out is gonna go to Joel March and Believer, which finished in third. I think it was the strongest vocally, and I felt like he was able to leave the best impression when putting aside the two songs that people were expecting to do well. Rockin' all, rockin' all over I believe that I'm on fire I can be the light Cause I know what to do over in Ukraine, we saw Vidbeer, which for the second year in a row had to record the main part of its program under secrecy because of the ongoing war. And it was so close to being pulled off without a hitch right until we were about to get the results and the voting app crashed. In the end, voting was left open for an extra day. And after pulling in over 700,000 votes, the winners were who everybody was expecting, Aliona Aliona and Jerry Hale. Now I can't say that I'm too surprised about the outcome, but I am really happy that it is them that's going because I really like the message behind Teresa and Maria. They also just have a unique dynamic between the two of them, bringing two different sounds to the song. And although Winter Buzz has quieted down a little bit, I do think that they're still in contention to win Eurovision. With respect to the other songs, I'm sure that some people would want to give a shout out to Melovin, Yagodi, or Nahaba, who all put on really strong performances. But for me, it's going to be a song that is massively underappreciated and actually came in last in the show, which is Slavic English by Nazva. This is the kind of entry that manages to be funny without undervaluing professionalism. The movement is well thought out and tightly executed, not just between the two performers, but with the backing vocalists as well. There's no dependence on shock value or cheap tricks. It's visually clean with a restrained color scheme. It's just very well done. I'm speaking. Melody Grand Prix in Norway is often a selection that attracts a lot of international fans. This year's edition continued with most of the changes that were introduced last year, which got rid of the duels that they used to have in favor of a system that's more similar to how Eurovision works. The only difference was that the televote was given more weight in the final than the jury, with a ratio of 60% for the televote and 40% for the jury. Now, I personally feel like the songs this year were some of the best that we've seen from Norway. They still had some of the more typical family-friendly songs that they're known for, but they were balanced out by others that felt a lot more mature. I also think that they've made a fantastic choice by going with Gotte as the winner, as I think it has a lot of potential to be a big, unforgettable performance on the Eurovision stage, and I'm just really looking forward to seeing it. I'm walking away from this MGP with a lot more songs in my library than I usually get. 
Margaret Berger's Oblivion is a favorite of mine. I also really enjoyed Dag and Anne's country duet, Judge Tenderly of Me. Even Goth Minister's We Come Alive I was into, which was a surprise to me even. But the shout out will actually go to a song that didn't qualify from the semifinals, Milo and Your Mine. Now, if you were watching that semifinal, you might have seen that when he was being interviewed, he was asked about how the song was being received in Norway. And that was because people were drawing a connection between his lyrics and some tragic homicides that had happened in the country. Now, obviously, we don't know whether or not that had an effect on him qualifying. I think the fact that he was asked about it certainly makes it a possibility. But unfortunate timing aside, this was a really great performance. I really liked the asylum concept that he had, as well as how he made it a bit cartoonish with the pastel blue color scheme so that it wasn't too serious. And from an energy point of view, I think it ticked all the boxes. There was strong development, the camera shots were really tight, and the choreography complemented the entire package. Definitely an entry that was worthy of the final. In Spain, we saw the third edition of Benidorm Fest, which is one of the selections that generates a lot of buzz and excitement, but it also seems to be held back by some technical problems and criticisms about the voting system. Now, this is the only selection that we were able to do a before, during, and after point of view on the channel, so I'm not going to repeat what I've already said about it. What I will say is that I really hope that they sort out these issues for 2025 because the future of this selection is not guaranteed beyond that point, and it would be a real shame for it to have to be scaled back or to lose it altogether. In terms of the winner, Nebulosa and Sora, it's not the most competitive choice, but it certainly feels like the right choice because of how excited it's made the Eurovision fans in Spain. And it's also provoked a national debate around feminism and the use of the word Sora as a slur. So it's always great to see a catchy, clever song prove its own point. For the shout out, I was tempted to go with the fan favorite San Pedro, who I believe had the most competitive choice out of the selection, but instead I'm gonna go with Maria Pelai and Remitente, which finished in sixth. It's a beautifully composed song song that's thought-provoking and gives me pause, because even though she's talking about Spanish history and I'm not from Spain, it does make me think about the rights that I have and take for granted. Malta's selection had the opportunity to get some unique attention because it started well before everything else all the way back in October, which is incredibly rare for a national selection. The beginning of it was a lot like Ireland's Eurosong in the sense that it wasn't a standalone program, but part of a special edition of a late night show called Show. Eventually, once they narrowed down the finalists, they did a more typical program, but it was with pre-recorded performances in a studio rather than on a stage in front of a live audience. Now I can see the benefit of doing a selection like this. It's most likely cost effective when you consider the total amount of airtime, and it also gives the opportunity for the audience to help narrow down the songs to their tastes and preferences. However, the overall quality of songs does not justify having a selection this big, and I think the perfect example of that is the fact that there was one semi-final where no songs qualified. You just can't have that many songs that people don't care about, because it discourages people to watch the entire program and tune in for the next edition. So this selection is clearly bloated. Now with all that said, I think that they went with one of their best options by giving the win to Sarah Benici and Loop. It was a song that stood out to me from an early point, and despite my reservations about its potential success at Eurovision, I have a harder time making a case for anything else. The shoutout is going to go to Cloudmaker by Oxygen, which didn't qualify for the final. The song brought a really relaxing energy to the selection, and it would have been really great to see it fleshed out on a larger stage because it needed atmosphere that wasn't available to it. And so my hope is that the production is a lot more selective for next year so that songs like these can be properly presented on stage. I will make, I will make, I will make the clouds for you, put white on blue. I don't care, I don't care, I don't care if I make it. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have the short and sweet UMK in Finland, where there was a lot of excitement about who would be following up Karia's second place finish last year. 
Before the show, there was a lot of confidence that the winner was going to be Sarasipala and Paskina. Her song was the most commercially successful out of the selection, she had a huge lead in the odds, and I was rightfully skeptical. UMK gives three times the power to the televote, and Finland does not vote for these kinds of ballads massively over novelty songs. It would have had to have been a very close margin, like it was in 2020, between Axel and Erika. Now, there's been a lot of debate around voting systems in this national selection season, and I understand why people like the idea of the public getting more of a say, because in the end, it is the entry that represents them at Eurovision. But I think that this is a good example of why three times the power might be a little too much, because I decided to play with the numbers a bit and keep the televotes the same. In order for Sara to have won, she would have needed a perfect jury score, and Windows 95 men would have needed all zeros. The jury was essentially useless here, and it's like, if you're gonna reduce their power so much, you might as well not have them at all. Regardless, Windows 95 Men is the winner, No Rules is the exact kind of song that people associate with Eurovision craziness. I wouldn't be surprised if come May it's gonna be him on the front of a bunch of articles around Eurovision, and so that alone might suggest that this would be a worthwhile choice. The shout-out will go to Jesse Markin with Glow, who finished in fifth. Aside from it being a personal favorite of mine in the selection, it also just felt very tastefully executed. It didn't depend on any gimmicks, it just focused on him and the dancers, and it didn't feel bare or lacking at any moment. It was very well done. In Latvia, we had another edition of Supernova. Latvia, of course, has been locked out of the grand final for the last few editions, and many people are hoping to see them make a comeback. Whether or not they'll do that with their winner, Dons and Hollow, is hard to say, because it definitely has strong merits in terms of its song and performance, but those tend to be the merits that the jury responds to more than the televote, and we don't have juries in the semifinals. So we could be looking at another year without Latvia in the final. The thing that I find about Supernova is that they have a peculiar selection of songs, and like, they usually have unique elements to them, sometimes genres that we don't see in other places, but sometimes they're held back by clunky lyrics or they just don't feel complete. At least I can say with this song, they went with the song that feels the most complete. As for the shout out, I'm going with the Cat Song by Katrina Gulapo, and this is something that I would never listen to outside the selection, but it's exactly what you would expect from a song about cats. and. It made me smile, at least. Don't you dare to ignore Kitty cat, kitty cat I wanna play with you Kitty cat, kitty cat In Italy, we had the grandfather event of the entire contest, San Remo. This year was the last edition to be hosted by Emma Deus, who has also served as the musical director since 2020. And for his last show, he went all out on the lineup of artists. Typically I get like seven or eight songs that I'll listen to after San Remo ends. This year I got 13, and because of that, each one of them is going to get a mention. Diamanti Grezzi, Mariposa, Casa Mia, Sinceramente, Tuta Gold, Ipeme Tu Pete, Uno Ragazzo, Una Ragazza, La Noia, La Rabbia Non Ti Basta, Apnea, Onda Alta, L'Amore in Boca, and Il Cielo No Ci Vole. And those were just my favorites. There were others that I just enjoyed watching and would be happy to listen to again. And as the cherry on top of this fantastic lineup of music, they went with one of the best winners. Angelina Mango is a great performer with a vibrant song that could possibly bring Italy their second victory in three years. I honestly wouldn't be surprised. Now for the shout out, I mean, you could consider this a shout out to the entirety of the musical lineup because San Remo alone has me like set for life. I am going to choose one though and I was tempted to go with Mahmoud and Tuta Gold because he's one of my favorite artists to have discovered through Eurovision and Soldi is my favorite Eurovision song of all time. But I'm actually going to go with Darjan D'Amico's song Onda Alta, which really struck a chord with me from the first listen. I love the intensity of it, I love the combination of orchestration and electronic elements, and the context of the song gives it emotional depth, focusing on the dangers of migrants crossing the Mediterranean. It's one of the most captivating songs of the year. Here. 
over in Germany, we had Das Deutsche Finale, or the German Final, which I think as a title represents the lack of imagination that a lot of people feel NDR has when they're going through the songs that should be put forward. This selection gets criticized a lot for emphasizing songs with radio airplay qualities, but they're not usually very immediate, and so a lot of people end up feeling underwhelmed by what the options are. This year there was slightly more enthusiasm, although most of it was around one song that didn't end up getting selected. It's also worth pointing out that NDR is not going to be handling Eurovision going forward from next year onward, and so it's probably not worth talking about how the selection can be improved because it could be very different by next year. Now, with respect to our winner, Isaac, and Always on the Run, like, sure, it might not be the most colorful, in-your-face, built-for-Eurovision song, and because of that, it could be heading for the bottom of the scoreboard again. But I think it's worth mentioning that Isaac is one of the best performers that we've seen from Germany in a while. He carries the performance with his expressions and his voice, and he's definitely an artist to be proud of. The shout-out will go to the song that was the fan favorite, Rick and Oh Boy. You don't often get these songs that are composed by someone who's classically trained, and it's this combination of delicate and powerful, which I think is a really hard thing to pull off. It also made some effective use of the lighting in the live performance, and it definitely would have been a worthy winner if it was chosen. SD Laul in Estonia is a selection that has a lot of variety, and is usually one that provides me with a handful of songs that I'll listen to afterwards. This year was no exception to that. They also introduced a new format, which put five songs in the final as automatic qualifiers, and it put the other 15 songs in a single semi-final to determine the remaining five spots. Now even with this format change, as a selection, I usually don't find it to be very exciting, because every year that I've followed it, the Estonian fan fans are usually able to identify which song will win from the time that they're announced, because it's usually just whatever act is most popular. In this case, people were saying that it was going to be Vis Minus Den Pulup, and that's exactly what happened. And so, a bit of a boring result, but despite that, this is one of the most unique songs that we have at Eurovision. It's definitely my favorite among the crazy party, this is Eurovision kind of songs, and I think that it could do really well. The shout out will go to Enga with Dog on a Leash, who didn't make it out of the semi-final, and apart from being right up my alley, musically speaking, I also just think that there's a lot to appreciate about it. The lyrics are unique and have a nice flow to them, the performance was strong, and they did everything that they needed to visually match the atmosphere of the song. Etapa Nacionala, I don't have too much to say about because I feel like we don't get a lot of context for the selection, and we also know that what we see here says nothing about what we expect at Eurovision because this is a fairly low-budget production, and Moldova often elevates their performances by the time they actually get to the Eurovision stage. The winner was Natalia Barbu and In the Middle, which as a winner makes perfect sense if you ask me. I like the mixture of strings and electronic elements, I like that it's got a beat to it, but it's not like an all-out dance banger, and I like the restrained approach to staging, which I feel like could be the basis of something that looks really beautiful. When looking at the overall selection of songs, it's quite clearly not at the same level as other selections are, so we're not going to focus on it too much. I can see why people wanted Valeria Pasha and Anti Princess to win. It's the biggest pop song in the bunch, and it feels very Eurovision, so that will be the shout-out. <laughs> Since the start of the 2020s, we haven't yet seen Denmark in the final. Danish songs tend to gather fans, but they have a hard time shaking the image of being inoffensive, and they don't usually inspire a lot of hope. Now this has been something that's been criticized for a while, and we've seen things like the Danish outlet Good Evening Europe come up with a survey where they sent it off to DR about improving Dansk Melody Grand Prix. I don't know if it had any influence on the lineup for this year because it seems to be more or less the same, but if they are open to feedback, then I think that we could be seeing some improvements sometime soon. Now since we're focusing on Denmark getting into the final, when we're looking at the song for this year, 
I'm sorry to say, but I, I don't think that Sand is powerful enough to really be a contender, especially because we're looking at so much diversity this year from other countries, and this one just feels quite ordinary, so I have a hard time imagining people voting for it in big numbers. I will say, though, that towards the end of the song, when Saba is really able to show off her vocals, it definitely becomes a lot more appealing. So it might not be a complete write-off, but I do think that we still see Denmark having this problem of not being strong enough. The shout out is gonna go to Johnny by Basim. There seemed to be a number of people who were opposed to this winning, which I guess I can understand on one level because musically speaking, it suffers from a lot of the same problems of the other Danish entries, but the story is really remarkable. Basim met this man Johnny while he was on his deathbed, and he felt like people only appreciated him because he was about to die and not while he was living. And here he is 12 years later, calling out his name, making sure that people know to appreciate the ones you love before they leave. Lithuania has also revamped their selection under the new name Erovisia.lt. It wasn't too different to the kind of selection that we had seen in the past, but it was considerably more competitive because it used to be that there would be heats and about half of the songs would qualify, then there'd be semifinals, and then there'd be a final. But in this case, it was just semifinals, only the top two advanced, and the other six would be eliminated. When talking about the number of songs, it is one of the larger selections that we see, and I could see some people feeling similarly to how I do about multiple Malta and, and the idea that they should go for a less is more approach, and I do feel that way, but at least in this case, all of the songs get the same stage, so it's a lot more of an even playing field. Our winner was Sylvester Belt and Luktelk, which I couldn't be happier with. It's been really great to see how much love this has been getting inside Lithuania, and my hope is that it's going to get just as much love when it goes to Eurovision, because this could be a real moment on stage. Choosing a song to give a shout out to is difficult because a lot of my attention went towards Sylvester, and so I decided to go with a semi-finalist, April Frey and her song New Year's, which is an acoustic ballad that you could compare to something like Billie Eilish or Leve. I thought it was a nice change of pace from the rest of the selection, and it was beautifully performed as well. Some people gain a lot of life out of sitting through all the performances in Una Voce per San Marino. I am not one of them. I did see the finalists, however, so I'm going to keep it brief and stick to those. Our winners were Megara, and this was probably an exciting moment for the people who first found out about them through Benidorm Fest last year. I think this is a great way for them to have the exposure and the experience of Eurovision without having to go through as many hurdles as there are for Benidorm Fest, because I think that for a band like theirs, it would be a lot harder to win. It's difficult to say whether or not this is the best choice for San Marino, because I think that one of the things that San Marino struggles with is a lack of a cultural identity, which isn't to say that they don't have one, but it's not one that we really get a sense of through Eurovision because they borrow artists from all over. What we can say is that they'll definitely be getting support from Spain in the semi-final, possibly even getting the full 12 points, but we'll have to see if Spanish fans are gravitating towards other songs more. The shout out will go to La Rua and Governo del Cuore, and there might be some personal bias on my end because I'm a big fan of Dardust and the songs that he's brought to San Remo and Eurovision but I do think that when looking at all the songs that were up against this one, it was a very well-deserved third place. Dora in Croatia was showing a lot of promise with its lineup, which was larger and included a lot of well-known names in the country. Unfortunately, we saw a lot of shaky performances and technical issues, so whatever promise that was there before doesn't seem to be there anymore. Now that's just talking about the show itself. When we talk about the winner, Rim Tim Tagidim and Baby Lasagna, there's a lot of excitement. Croatia is currently sitting at number one in the odds to win Eurovision. Now truthfully, I'm skeptical about that, and it mostly has to do with the fact that I just don't think this is going to get enough jury support, but I will say that if it does happen, you won't find me complaining. I, I think that if this is able to reach enough people and be the televote winner, for example, and then secure a win, then that will be something to celebrate. Now, if we were looking at the songs before the show, my shout out would have wholeheartedly gone to Eugen and Tijene, which has one of my favorite music videos of the year. But if we're talking about the actual show itself, I think the song that left the best impression was Lying Eyes by Vinko, and I think the performance speaks for itself. 
Sungvakepnen in Iceland is not usually a selection that attracts a lot of controversy, and yet this year it was the most controversial by far. Now we went into a lot of detail about the majority of the discussion around Bashar Murad, who is Palestinian, and the concerns around having him participate with Israel's besiege of Gaza going on in the background. When Bashar advanced to the superfinal and ended up losing to Hera Bjork, the conversation turned ugly on all sides. Hera was criticized for agreeing to go to Eurovision with Israel participating. One of the writers of her song cut ties with it. Bashar faced more racism and homophobia. Viewers reported problems with the voting app in the superfinal that caused their votes to go towards the other song. And an employee of Israel's broadcaster claimed that he convinced people to vote for Hera out of concern that Bashar would win Eurovision. A lot of people feel like the mood has been completely ruined after this. Polls have suggested that between 42 and 40% of Icelanders no longer want to take part this year. So let's try and address a few things about this. Firstly, with respect to Hera, she did what every other artist does. She came with a song, she performed it, and let the people decide. She did not choose to be the one to vote for out of protest of another artist. When she goes to Eurovision, she'll be up against other songs and none of this will be a factor. Unfortunately, I don't think that this is a competitive song on its own, but it's the one we've got. With respect to Bashar, the backlash that he faced was horrible, but unfortunately expected. It's one of the risks that you take by being unapologetic about your identity. And it's also one of the risks that you take when you make an overt political statement, because sometimes it can make people's votes more about that than about the actual song itself. Even when we factor out the possibility that some votes were not made legitimately, I do think that the end results make sense, and I don't think we would see a different winner if everything was working properly. And so beyond that, I don't know what else to say other than I understand why people are upset, and I'm sorry. On a positive note, I'll be walking away from the selection with four songs that I really like. Three of them didn't even make it out of the semi-finals. Flo by Seastone, Fitrildi by Sunny, and Love You by Blankefur. The fourth song is the one that will get the shout out, and it is, of course, Wild West by Bashar Murad. This was a historic moment, ugly as it was, and I'm glad that it brought a much needed conversation to our space. Pesma za Eurovizio in Serbia has continued to surprise me with the variety of music in the selection. It's really given me a different impression of what Serbian music is, and as far as I'm concerned, they can just keep doing what they're doing. I'm very intrigued by it. Going with Teodora and Ramonda as the winner makes sense to me. I think it might be a little too subtle for Eurovision, but I know that the meaning of the song has really resonated with people in Serbia, and I think that it was among the better choices when looking at the favorites. Among the other songs, the ones that I'll be listening to include Bedem by Christina, Samo by Chai, and Zovi Melena by Lena Kovacevic. But I couldn't possibly give the shout out to anyone other than Constracta for being the queen of subverting expectations. There's a very interesting video essay by Rudy about all the ways that this song explores the ideas of new and better, which is what the title is in Serbian. There's a political angle to it that addresses how people are dissatisfied with Serbia's government that's been in power for over a decade, I believe. There's also a consumerist angle about it that addresses how we as humans are constantly wanting new and better things. And there's also an artistic angle, which is about how hard it can be to be trying to outdo yourself constantly because people expect you to always be doing new and better. So she sets everyone up by pointing right at what people are expecting, a new, better entry to follow up on Incorpore Sano. And what does she do? She brings the exact same thing. Niti novo, niti bolje neither new nor better. Obviously, it's not the exact same thing because that wouldn't be clever, but it starts right where Incorpore Sano left off in Turin. It uses a lot of the same elements and has the same setup. And so, of course, it was going to confuse people and make them think that she threw the competition, but the competition never mattered to her. She entered the competition in 2022 solely to promote her EP, and it just happened that people loved it. She did the unthinkable and rose above the competition to make a statement that applies to all of us, especially those of us that follow Eurovision. 
We saw so many artists return to selections this year and not make it, and a lot of them were living in the shadows of their legacy. Anyway, I'm really grateful for this song and performance. I could gush about it for a lot longer, but we have another two selections to get to, so let's play it and move on. <laughs> In our host country, Sweden, we saw another edition of Melody Festivalen, which is known for having high-end TV production. And this year, they were choosing the entry that would represent them on the home stage. In our selection review, we talked about one of the changes to the show this year, which got rid of the second chance round and replaced it with a runoff vote. Because it's been so controversial, it seems unlikely that they'll go back to that for future years. So for 2025, we'll probably see an entirely new idea put in, or they'll go back to the system they had before. The winners were Marcus and Martinez with the song Unforgettable, which was honestly a pretty expected result. They were considered to be very likely to win back when they were announced in November, and I think that by the time that we actually saw the performance, it was a done deal. Now, specific to the song, I still have my reservations about how it works on its own, but at the end of the day, this is television, and I think that the impact of the performance justifies it enough. For the first time ever, I think, I'm walking away from this Melfest with no songs that I'll be listening to after, Usually there's like one or two, but none of them really grabbed me this year. So for the shout out, I'll go with the song that I think came the closest to having the full package, which would be Jacqueline and Effortless. I really loved how sleek and stylish it was, and I think that it could have been an equally good choice to go to Eurovision with. Last but not least, we have Festival de Cansao in Portugal. They were marking their 60-year anniversary since they debuted at Eurovision, and with that we saw a number of musical tributes and special guests make appearances throughout the show. This is always one of my favorite selections because it has a completely different vibe to everything else. Rather than going for catchy melodies and big stage shows, they focus a lot more on composition and storytelling, and for that reason it just feels like a much-needed breath of fresh air. Our winner was Yolanda with the song Gritu, who made a big impact with her first performance in the semi-final. To me, from that point on, she seemed like the best choice, and I'm really happy that they went with her in the end. It has such a beautiful energy to it, and I'm really excited to see it go bigger in Eurovision. The songs that I'm going to be taking away from this edition include Rita Onofri's Criatura, Cristina Clara's Primavera, Maria Joao's Gia, which definitely should have been in the final, and the shout-out will go to Leo Midea and Dosi Mysterio. He proudly wore his Brazilian identity on his sleeve, even though he was criticized for it with this beautiful love song that has an uplifting spirit. As a performer, he's really likable, and I'm glad that he reached enough people to get to third place. And with that, that's the end of the national selection season for 2024. Let me know in the comments which songs you'll be listening to now that they've ended, and which ones would you give a shout out to. If you liked this video, I would love to have your support on Buy Me A Coffee, or if you subscribe to the channel, we can keep chatting about Eurovision as it comes closer. There's still a lot more to talk about, and I'd love to know what you have to say. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.